so then I looked and I and I opened this baggie with this stuff and I started smoking it and it did not it didn't change its physical appearance it still looked like this Santa Marta gold but the odor and everything was just the most the finest hash I've ever smoked so I thought that the millennium had come that forever after we would all trash yes the end of the world is when all trash is Mazari Sharif uh, hash <laughs> when trash becomes hash <laughs> But, but at the crack of dawn the next morning, I went tearing down to my harshest critic and knelt beside her hammock and woke her up and said, you know, you've got to smoke this. And of course, you know, garbage was back. <laughs> So, so I don't know why I got off into this. I guess it was the life is art thing, and this thing about what would you do if you could do anything. Enhance that little story with the myth, isn't it, from New Guinea uh, about the good ship? Do you remember that one where they generated? Uh, uh, you mean the thing about the resin, where yeah, the resin, resin bar grew longer? Yes, I'm not sure how this relates to it, but I'll tell it. In the study of messianic movements, in fact, you can read about this in, in Sylvia Thrupp's book, Millennial Dreams in Action, where she talks about a number of millennial religious groups. There was a movement around 1910 in Java called the Kalu Kalupan Movement. And it was some guy was sitting on his porch one day in a hut off in the jungle, and he was playing his flute. And they collect copal in the forest there and sell to traders. And as he was playing his flute, he noticed that this bar of rolled out copal multiplied to twice its size right in front of him. And not only did this happen, but at the same moment it happened, his mind was flooded with the sudden realization that the meaning of this event was that all human lives were now going to be twice as long as they had previously been before. And he started, uh, he told people in his village, and he had the proof because they had this bar of copal that was twice as long than anybody ever rolled them in that village. So it spread from village to village. And uh, before long, people from all over uh, Java were vectoring in on this place. And uh, eventually the army had to be sent to put up roadblocks and turn people back. And uh, it all had to do with the, this piece of resin which had doubled in length while this guy was playing his flute. And that is what's called a cognitive hallucination. A cognitive hallucination. Right, an idea becomes so real to you that you see it, but then there's this funny border where maybe it becomes so real that other people see it, mm. and maybe that's actually how we keep enlarging and complicating reality, is by having <laughs> consensual like cognitive hallucinations of that's what's right. possible. That's right. Mm. Yeah. The, the Iowa Scaro that Kat mentioned that we like so much and worked with in Peru, Don Fidel, he lived behind, he lived off this road when we knew him a few miles down this trail, and we would go over there often and walk with him back and forth between there, his house and where we could catch these little jitney buses into town. And he said one afternoon as we were walking along through the Amazon jungle, apropos of nothing, he said, this is the path that Christ walked when he lived on earth. And it became so. You saw that somehow this was not a logical statement. This was a statement about the transposition of time and dimensionality and that he was living in the light of Christ, that he was living in the presence of the Master through being enveloped in a cognitive hallucination. And uh, I think our entire culture is headed for being enveloped in a cognitive hallucination where our real wishes will be fulfilled and that's why it's so important to uh, to find out what our real wishes are one of the most powerful forms of yoga one of the highest yogas is what's called the Anuttara Yoga Tantra and it involves a series of visualizations and they say imagine your home as a splendid palace 
and imagine the common utensils of your everyday life as golden vessels, vessels of beaten gold encrusted with jewels. Imagine your raiment as being made of the finest silk and imagine yourself as a god centered in the midst of all of this splendor. Well, this is like trying to induce what in Western psychotherapy is called a delusion of grandeur. A delusion of grandeur is when you're a hell of a lot happier than other people think you should be, you know? And uh, you say, what do you have to be so happy about? <laughs> and it's all about infusing the quality of life with greater purity. We were saying around the fire last night that the way to relate to the millennium is to make it happen as soon as possible in your life so that you become a spectator to it as a historical phenomenon. Well, the way to make it happen in your life is to not transcend desire, but transmute it so that what you really want is what you actually have, oh. you know. I find um, on these plants, on the mushroom particularly, I found it effective to um, will, to choose to become an archetype that I both, of course, have to be able to identify as an archetype, but then also one that I can relate to and, and wish to be and, and become, you know, as large, a hundred, a thousand times larger than we are, and as smooth and as everything is right you know you can you can practice being in the Tao so deeply in those states and knowing that everything you do no matter how minuscule it is you're doing most gracefully and everything you say you're saying most eloquently and you know even um, I've used the mending sock thing because I sometimes I feel like that's what I'm doing is that level of work but then I'm doing it perfectly you know and that's that's a great feeling. If you indulge in that feeling of being the goddess or a god or goddess or a, one of whatever you identify with, you know, one of the kachinas, whatever, then you can um, carry it back. It's a really good way to carry it back into your daily life. And, mm. and, uh, I, and learn to practice it, either in moments when you're wobbly and you suddenly need to grow into the situation or in moments of ecstasy you know I mean to be archetypes making love is it's pretty good <laughs> <laughs> well that's the technique of tantric practice of imagining these gods in union with their consorts in sexual union I guess the people burning to speak should speak Maybe one comment um, <laughs> that in different parts I keep hearing people saying that we don't know anything, but I think we're all dancing around it very well, and I think you're dancing around it really well, and so I think we do know something, not a lot perhaps, but we do know something. If words are that important and do have that meaning, meaning whether it's what we're saying that is true or just the sound of our voice that is true something is true we're here uh, I think we're beginning to say the unsayable I just have that feeling <laughs> <laughs> and what a feeling it is <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot has to do with trust. Um, I'm not going to say that because that's called an You just got to say it. And then you move on. Until it, it keeps forming. It's like a creation. Words, thought, ideas. They, they, they attach themselves to this larger structure and keep getting larger and larger. Pieces fall off. People add. Um, but just trust is that leap of faith to the other side of what you can't see, what you can't understand. To trust it as you trust your lover, as you trust a friend. Uh, and it doesn't always work out, but trust is the only way. Uh, 
because uh, otherwise there is only fear. Uh, fear of ourselves, fear of others, fear of ideas. I think this community is part of that, of building trust among people who have different ideas. I'd like to say something about learning and teaching with regard to the psychedelic experience. That you can use a lot of verbiage in trying to explain to people what that search is about and what that adventure will yield. But in the end, probably the best communication is to just dispense the document. I think it's very holy work, and I just want to express my appreciation to those who are involved in that work with great respect for the sacrament and for those to whom they dispense it. And I'm just very happy to be associated with you folks. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's something I've missed for a long time since the days of the 60s was the last time I was around people who knew about that work and approached it with the kind of reverence that I see here. The great thing about the psychedelics is that they speak for themselves. So they need no priest, no interpreter. Uh, they can deliver their message all by themselves. So my question has to do with, um, is there sense, some sense of the re-emergence or the, uh, in the Joyce sense, here comes everybody, the democratization of, uh, of that ability? In, in future culture. Yes, well, I think so. I think that the way these uh, hieroglyphic languages, especially Mayan and Egyptian, differ from uh, alphabetic languages is that uh, etymology remains on the surface in a hieroglyphic language so that uh, thousands of meanings are immediately visibly present and and so it's more like an ideogram rather than a word with a dictionary meaning you couldn't really I doubt that a Mayan could conceive of a dictionary of Mayan glyphs because they're they're uh, they infinitely shade off one into another so that and and that kind of sensitivity to the depth of language and to the uh, presence of the past in the present in a word is what Joyce is trying to do in Finnegan's Wake, you know. And that's why if you read it carefully, you feel many historical layers of meaning in the same passage because he wrote it with almost a pictographic consciousness of the meaning of the words rather than a lineal and literary sense of it. So, yes, it's uh, in, in that sense, uh, it's like that. How this will be achieved in the future in our culture, I'm not sure. The control of the Macintosh through an internationally set of under, an internationally understood set of control glyphs is very weird and if any of you have worked with a Macintosh you immediately see ah this idea which seems very odd could in fact I could learn this very quickly and and anyone can do it kind of thing maybe presages a you know a world of illiterate computer users <laughs> who who communicate with computers through symbols because literacy has been lost but it's it's very interesting, uh, yeah. So you see, computers might play a role in that kind of um, visual component. Actually, I've heard you talk about. Um, actually, Bruce, when you asked your question about will will computers become intelligent to life, I've heard you talk about it more that um, we the technology of computers will become available to us as almost a biological extent. Yes, that's what I think will happen. That, I mean, my vision of a perfect world is where you know the Earth is restored to its.
prehistoric Edenic perfection, but technology has not been eliminated. It's merely been micro-miniaturized to the point where the computers which maintain the history of the race and the governance of the planet have all been secreted in a certain pebble which lies on a certain beach somewhere on the planet and we walk around in perfect harmony with nature and in perfect and complete touch with an imaginary holographic world uh, that is our self-expression as a city is our self-expression to then be simultaneously you know in the world of techni and in the world of nature but with neither violating the other and I think that's reasonable in fact I think perhaps in a sense this is what uh, so-called preliterate cultures in the Amazon and places have achieved that's how it looks to them from the inside they have an extremely rich inner life it isn't maintained by vast computer networks and projected into holographic space and taped onto magnetic tape and all of that but it's still in feeling it's the notion that the richest world is within and that you uh, promote a balance with the exterior world but then the purpose of the leisure created when you have achieved balance is not then to accumulate things but to explore the interior horizon of transcendence through the recitation of myth and ecstasis and, uh, and this sort of thing. Terence, in connection with Robert's <coughs> question, conjunction with it, could you further elaborate this idea of the material externalization of the soul and the internalization of the body as a definitive thing in evolution? Well, I think imagination is uh, where we want to go, that this has become the arrow of our epigenetic development because everybody says, in the future, you'll have everything you want. Well, if we believe this, then we have to think seriously about what everything you want is. I mean, obviously, you want plenty of food, plenty of clothes, plenty of money, plenty of friends. But then if you get all that and then they say, well, you still, you haven't even dented your credit account. Well, then it says, well, I want to live at Versailles, surrounded by brilliant robots who... And I want great writers and artists to have lunch with me every day, and then and, and the Hope Diamond and uh, Rembrandt, and it, eventually this becomes very silly. And instead, there is an ascent toward uh, truly grandiose aspirations, you know, truly uh, bodhisattvic calling. And I think that uh, that this the rich the imagination is the real frontier. This is why the poets and the artists are, uh, are so important. And, and this is why I think one of the aspects of the space thing that is never mentioned by the L5 Society or any of these engineering types who are so into it is the interesting thing about outer space. We are not going to go through space to other worlds that will be very incidental to going into space. Going into space means going into space, that space itself is a medium with unique properties for a species such as ourselves. And one of those unique properties is that engineering, which on the surface of the planet has to always be cognizant of uh, stress and bearing loads and the limitation of materials, engineering is just going to become like ballet and objects miles in extent can be created that are obedient only to the laws of the human imagination and of course the 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 funding available to create these things but in other words the constraints of nature are pretty much lifted outer space is very much like what you see when you close your eyes in a dark room it's a vast unfilled void into which anything whatsoever can be projected. The hallucinations of the individual are, are the cultural artifacts of the species 500 years from now. I mean, all these visions and dreams that we have will be realized. 
I mean, in ways that we cannot imagine, but realize nevertheless. This has been consistently what has been going on. The alchemical dreams of the 16th century are fully realized in the 20th century, you know. And, of course, it has facets that they never imagined. But uh, going into space and going into the imagination is the same thing. And in the same way that... Um, the New World presented a tremendously tight genetic filter to immigrants so that only the soldiers of fortune, the religious fanatics, and exiles came to this place. And that created a unique gene mix. Space is going to be a much tighter genetic filter. I mean, most people who go are going to be very smart and very healthy and... Uh, and uh, very quickly, I think, a space type will arise, but I don't think you can create a space-based civilization without recourse to psychedelic plants and the psychedelic experience, because it's too much the same thing, you know, without, if you don't integrate psychedelics into the leap to space and realize that what is happening is that more and more we perfect the uh, aspiration to vertical ascent. In the myth of Icarus and Daedalus, you get this. Then in the brothers Montgolfier and their gas-filled balloon, and then the Wright brothers, and then the Apollo project. All of these things are, you know, this aspiration to ascension. And it is uh, apparently a biological drive. I mean, some people have suggested it's a nostalgia for the canopies of the rainforest that no longer exist. But whatever it is, it's going to take us eventually out to the stars and inward to the stars. Because, uh, you know, the real question mark which hangs over all this is the nature of mind. And we do not know what mind is. And yet everything goes on upon the stage that is conditioned by and assumes mind as a given. And uh, every society has assumed that it had the answers, that just 15 years more of fine-tuning of the current ideology would do it. And no society has ever been right about that. So why should we be right? We are hurtling toward an unimaginable future in the same way that our present would have been unimaginable to people 200 or 500 years ago. But it is, uh, it is the imagination because it is consciousness that is growing and expanding and strengthening itself. And if we take the notion that these uh, psychedelic plants are consciousness expanding agents, this is what they were originally called, consciousness expanding drugs, if you take that seriously for a moment, how can you not center it in your life? I mean, obviously consciousness is what must be expanded as fast as possible at all costs in all times and places because it is a lack of consciousness that will uh, be toxic to our species and the planet. Consciousness is the, the saving grace and so it has to be cultivated by any means uh, available. Yeah. You're saying that this urge to go into space is something like a biological urge and also maybe something relating to the, the rainforest. And, um, well, I we, think we're like the trigger species. Yeah, well, what I, the point I want to make is that, you know, when we think of going to space, we're so human-centered, and it's like, yes, us as humans can exist in space and exist there, but I think what's really important about going away from this planet's surface is it's not just a human-centered thing, it's a totally biological thing, and that we are just the implements of it. We are the thinking, conscious, creative tool-makers that will be able to implement this, getting off of this gravity trap, this gravity well, but it's not just for humans, it's for all life, and we have to, it's, it'll be a complete synthesis of oh, yes. all biological if, life that will exist away from the planet. If we, we go be, to space, we will take everybody with just us. Like, just like in a rainforest, it's not just... It's everything. It's, it's That's right. We are the species that is deputized to use energy 
to do the thing for all life on the planet. That's why I am not pessimistic about history, and I don't see history as unnatural or somehow opposed to nature. What history is is a 10,000-year process by which the monkeys attain enough understanding of physical processes to build the habitats into which all life on the planet can then migrate. That's what I was talking about this morning when I said I think the planet senses the finite of its the finiteness of its existence and that biology is a wild scheme for getting out to the stars for dispersal of uh, of life and you're right no we though we have great hubris and believe we are doing this and man will go to the stars it's more that man is the pecking beak of the cosmic egg, of the cosmic chick in the egg of life on earth and the entire bird will emerge and fly but it was man with his atomic weapons and his radar and all this who who can break the shell and then the whole of the biosphere will flow outward into space and escape the cycle of energy degradation that will eventually turn this solar system into a group of cold cinders rotating around a, a, a red uh, giant or a something. Yes, well, we're trying to compare our maps. Everybody has seen different pieces of a geography whose total size we don't know. So we don't know, maybe none of our maps overlap. Or maybe some do and some don't. And maps which don't overlap are not invalidated. It just means nobody has been there but you. I mean, I often have the feeling that I'm seeing things that no one has ever seen before. Often. Leon asked me to talk about time. Leon is off on alone time, so he'll miss this. The thing that really interests me or draws me back to the psychedelic experience again and again is the notion that there's something that you can learn that would somehow be... Uh, have an impact on society at large that when, that when you have the psychedelic experience it's like you're a sailor on some kind of a vast ocean where you let down your net into the deeps and the hope is that you will snare an idea of some sort and of some size and it may be you know that you come up with the equivalent of tuna, which is many small ideas, or and perhaps you bring up your nets and see that they have just been shredded by something so large that you <laughs> scarcely care to imagine it. But the, the hope is to land an idea of intermediate size that uh, you can then fully um, explore and understand when you s go into that ocean as a swimmer you see these things passing in review uh, things of such beauty and intricacy and complexity that you are literally speechless and even speechless in terms of an interior dialogue about what you're seeing you can't, uh, it just blows your mind and washes past you in such profusion that there seems to be the notion of capturing it seems to be like the notion of a child emptying the ocean with a cup. But if you have a net, and I'm not sure what a net is exactly, but it's a way of somehow capturing these psychedelic ideas and then bringing them back for examination and I think um, part of it rests on a technique of uh, cyclical recitation to yourself of what you've seen so that you carry a vision 
to a level of reflection in memory as you pull away from it. And then 10 minutes later, you tell yourself again what has just happened. And then 20 minutes later again, so that you get a series of telescoping images which are granted a compression of the original event. But nevertheless, they bear the, uh, the uh, stamp of what the thing was. So the thing of this class that has happened to me is a very peculiar idea about time, which was developed uh, fairly suddenly, as I would imagine ideas develop uh, in me in the early and mid-70s. And then it was pretty much formulated in my head, but it took the invention of small computers to make it possible to write software so that I could actually talk to other people about this idea. Well, since we have no computers and not even a blackboard, this will be a kind of feeling tone uh, excursion into talking about this theory of time. It's, um, it has an abstract foundation and a practical foundation. Its abstract foundation is the notion that uh, time is different than we have come to conceive of it as the legacy of Western science. The legacy of Western science is that time is duration, that time is a dimension necessary for process, and it's usually thought of as a flat plane against which some other fluctuating variable can be plotted. This is called, you know, linear time. Um, and Newton's physics took the same view of space. The Newtonian view of space was that it was essentially emptiness. It was something which you had to have if you wanted to put something somewhere. So it was a kind of an abstract uh, plenum. But Einstein showed that space is actually some kind of uh, thing. It has properties of thingdom. It is distorted in the presence of a large magnetic field. And, uh, and so it, it rose out of the realm of abstraction and then was cognized as an objectifiable entity, a topological manifold that was real. This is, I think, the same step that has to be taken for time. Time is not simply the dimension of duration required for the successive occurrence of occasions. It is rather some kind of conditioned topological manifold. We can think of it as um, a, a fluid medium flowing across a surface, a river in other words. In some places the river is very broad and shallow and meanders because the pitch of the incline over which it's moving is so slight that it can barely discern which way to move. You see this often in the Amazon. In other situations, the incline increases and the speed of the flow increases and the depth of the channel increases and the sides of the distance between the banks decreases. So time runs slowly and it runs quickly. It has a kind of modulated speed. Well, it's been a, uh, a commonplace of Western cosmology since Darwin, although it's never been elevated to the status of a law or even a principle, that complex, steady complexification has occurred in the universe since its very beginning, that this is uh, something that we see in the very first moments of physics and proceeding right up into our own day. In other words, in the era before physics, 
that period of time so short that it's the period of time, it's less than the amount of time necessary for the photon to cross the radius of the nucleus of the atom, there was absolute chaos and a complete absence of physics. And then what sprang into being was a physics of pure electrons, of pure energy. And it was not for many seconds that uh, temperatures fell to a point such that other factors could come into play, such that free electrons could fall into atomic orbitals and, uh, and, and this sort of thing. And at each successive level of cooling, new forms of order became possible. At first, everything was just this plasma of particles and energy. And then atomic systems <coughs> sprang into being. And then at still lower temperatures, these atomic systems were able to form molecular systems. The energy level in the general medium dropped below the level at which it would disrupt the molecular bond. So then molecules came into being. And then, at that point, there was the aggregation of stars and the cooking out of the heavier elements through the, the process of cooking hydrogen so that iron and carbon, and these things, then arose. And by this time, the universe is much cooler than it was at the beginning. And then, finally, you get uh, temperature regimes and environmental situations where very large colloidal molecular uh, species can come into being, large polymerized molecules, and, uh, and this st sets the stage for DNA, which once it emerges, and the, the thing to notice at each of these stages of complexification is that it requires a shorter time than the processes preceding it. If the universe is... Uh, let's uh, take the long view and say 20 billion years old, then the first 10 billion years, not very much happened that was interesting in the realm of complexity. There was star formation and uh, the percolation of heavy chemistry, but not life, and, or it's doubtful that life occurred in the early universe. So. What we see then is the emergence of more and more complex animal forms at a greater and greater speed. And then finally the emergence of self-reflection in the primates. And then epigenetic methods of encoding information. In other words, writing and storytelling and language. And uh, at each point, what is happening is there's a progressive time binding of energy and a progressive intensification and speed up of the complexification of certain parts of the universe. Right now, the most complex part of the universe that we know is the human brain mind situated in its network of computers and cultural conventions and social obligations and expectations and hopes and fears and historical aspirations, etc. And this is the realm of the densely packed that the Buddhists are talking about. So it seems to me that this should be seen as the operation of a general law. And we are not outside of this. We are, in fact, the cutting edge of it. Somehow, of all the animal species on the earth, the human beings are carriers of this temporal speeding up process, which is now engulfing uh, the entire planet. And... Uh, so that's the general law or the general perception upon which this idea I elaborated was based, the notion that complexification is being conserved through time and being built up as uh, some quality that the universe is very interested in maintaining. And then I looked at the chain, which I hope uh, is familiar to most of you. I'm sure it probably is. It's a very ancient Chinese oracle system of, that uses what are called hexagrams, which are six 
leveled ideograms of broken or unbroken lines and the possible subset of these things is 64 which is an interesting number because it's the number which DNA operates on because it uses 64 codons and in fact I came to see that as no coincidence that actually life was organized around this number and the I Ching as well because both were subject to uh, a set of rules which was uh, surfacing in the phenomenon of biological organization and the organization of a Chinese oracular theory for understanding past and future time. But And I looked at what is called the sequence, which is the way in which you move from one hexagram to the next and I sought order there and found order that I think had been lost since pre-Han, perhaps pre-Zhou time. And I came to see the I Ching as we possess it today as an archaeological artifact, a piece of broken machinery. It's like the turbine of a jet plane. You puzzle over it and you see that it could be used for something and you do use it for things and it's very effective, but it's really a piece of broken machinery from a very ancient technology which ceased to exist before the rise of the Han Dynasty. And what it was, was it, it was like a uh, Taoist technology of understanding time that by the practice of certain techniques whose historical uh, echoes I think you get in the stilling of the heart techniques of Vajrayana Buddhism these people were able to see into the quantum mechanical foundations of thought and consciousness and they noticed there a flux which they called the Tao, and it was a thing which came and went. The Tao Te Ching says the way that can be told of is not an unvarying way. And they stilled their body functions and they looked inward with a cataloging analytical mentality. And they noticed that while this flux was variable, it seemed to be not infinite in its uh, in its. Uh, contributing factors, but that in fact it seemed to have a pattern. And they discerned the pattern as revolving around the number 64. In other, way, in other words, they discerned through this process of meditation temporal elements that had a kind of ontological validity that the material elements of the periodic table have for matter that there is not one kind of time or two kinds of time but actually 64 facets of the possible temporal jewel and they saw that any moment in time was the combination and the overlay of uh, this wave system which they call Tao and it was a harmonic wave system. It had, uh, it had uh, periods of self-expression which were very short in duration on the order of seconds or hours or microseconds. It had levels of expression which were cognizable in the human world as years and decades and centuries. And it had vast resonant periods which were as large as history and then larger many times periods of historical or periods of uh, temporal resonance which could only be referenced to the life of the planet and this is I think uh, you know part of the Chinese notion of uh, the Tao of heaven earth and man these are different speeds at which these temporal waves of conditioning of the world of phenomenal appearance are moving. And if you, if you take an idea like this uh, seriously, even as a personal discipline of thought to, to picture it, to visual it, visualize it in a Vajrayana spirit, then you see that what's really being offered 
is a map of time. It's saying that um, the condition of knowing a fading past and facing an unanticipatable future is not an ontologically given necessity of existence that it is possible to imagine an existence in which one saw into time the way we as animals see into the space in front of us so that we are able to run and leap and dance among the rocks. It's because we can see into space. A creature that, or a culture that could see into time could anticipate where the river of time would flow quickly where it would broaden out and move slowly with a rich sense of the conservation of accomplishments achieved, where it would cascade and break up its previous patterns and produce great cataracts of novelty. A civilization which knew these things, or a person which knew these things about their own life, would claim a new dimension of existential freedom for being. And, um, you know, I was having this whispering entity, this demon, this logos, show me these things. And it was expressed on a very, very practical level. I mapped what is called the first order of difference in the sequence of the I Ching. That means how many lines change as you go from one hexagram to another. And I discovered that it looked like a random wave. It looked like a stochastic slice, except that at the beginning and the end, there were tongue and groove points of fit if you rotated the thing 180 degrees and brought it down against itself so that the thing achieved closure at the beginning and the end. This satisfied me that I was dealing with an artifact of nature, uh, you know, that I was dealing with an organized structure, either of nature or created by intelligence. And then using the principle of hierarchical resonance and stacking of modules into, uh, into hierarchies, which is the, really the principle by which all Chinese metaphysics has operated from the very beginning, I created um, a cosmic calendar which had where each level was a resonance of the level below it, but either collapsed or multiplied by a factor of 64. I discovered a very, well, recall that um, because the I Ching is 64 hexagrams with uh, six lines in each hexagram, it's composed basically of 384 yao, or lines. And I discovered that this number, 384, has a very interesting property. The uh, cycle of the moon is 29.5 days. So that if you take 29.5 times 13, it's something like 383.93. And it seemed to me then immediately obvious that that part of what the machinery of the I Ching was describing in the humanly cognizable phenomenal world was the cycle of the moon using a 384-day lunar calendar which precessed 19 days a year against the solar calendar. And when you take that 384-day unit and multiply it times 64, you uh, get 67 years and some months and days. This is exactly six 11-year sunspot cycles. And China is the first place where we have historical records of the observation of sunspots. So that's one sunspot cycle for each line in the six line hexagram. Also, sunspot cycles have a greater peak every third cycle. So that's one large sunspot cycle for each hexagram in that trigram. And I saw then that there were uh, these resonances. When you take that number, 67 years, again times 64, you get 4,306 years. And uh, that was that works out to, let's see, 
4,306, 200, 150 years for each zodiacal sign. So it's like each zodiacal sign is claim is uh, slotted to one trigram. And these are all, notice that all these things that this resonance calendar is predicting are things visible to the naked eye. We're talking about movements of constellations, sunspots, and, um, and the moon. So I saw then that this was a tremendously powerful natural calendar that, that was a, a technology developed by proto-Daoist Central Asian shamanism very, very long ago. But it had this curious property of when the wave was mathematically analyzed in modern mathematical by modern mathematical methods so that we could draw these maps of novelty we could see then that it showed us the map of the temporal river from earliest beginnings to the collapse of the state vector at some time in the future and so it was obvious then that if we could lay the map over the portion of reality we had already experienced, we could then propagate the map forward into the future and know and begin to take hold of ourselves in this other temporal dimension. And so it became a question of what is the best fit of this undulating wave of novelty and I used the word novelty out of Alfred North Whitehead's philosophy because he, he had this notion that novelty was the concressing of a force which knits things together. And, uh, and I like that. That's what I felt it was, that the Tao is making itself and that this compression of novelty through the speeding up of time will eventually reach a place where everything is connected to everything else. And this is, you know, the universe's self-birthing of itself. Well, you must be aware of all these uh, very straight studies which say if we keep increasing how fast we go by the year 2020, we'll go... To ten times the speed of light, if we keep increasing how much energy re we release by so-and-so, we'll release the energy in the sun. The propagation of all these curves of development become asymptotic, and then nobody knows how to interpret what they mean. They just seem to mean that the whole culture is going to go kazawe, you know. And this is sort of the idea that this theory implies. It implies that far from the universe being a steady state entity uninfluenced by the existence of the human mind which is going to go on and exist for billions of years until the stars burn out and the second law of thermodynamics is going to reduce everything to heat death that that's all wrong a hundred percent wrong and that actually the universe is made by mind within and without organism and that mind is a, a capable of bootstrap leaps in its organizational self-expression and that we are uh, privileged to be the witnesses of the final act of life going through some kind of immense transformative um, unfolding from itself in a kind of vortex which has been building on this planet for billions of years, but which has been accelerating to, you know, such excruciating intensities over the last 25,000 years that it has called forth self-reflective intelligence from the monkeys and the invention of quantum physics and space flight and shamanism. And it is novelty upon novelty, novelty, novelty so intensified that the genetic machinery can no longer carry it and it bubbles out into the epigenetic, into art and language and poetry and religion and religious mania and romanticism and uh, all of these things. It is a progressive knitting together and expression of the universe's will to become that causes me to think that we may be in the shorter 
gyres, as William Butler Yeats called them, the shortening spirals of this vortex of novelty and compression. You see a curious quality about this kind of cosmology that I'm describing, a cosmology where each uh, epoch is preceded by an epoch which is a 65, 64 times greater in duration. <coughs> the curious thing about that is that you only need about 20 multi instances of multiplication before you go from a period of time smaller than the duration of Planck's constant, which is uh, uh, 1.55 times 10 to the minus 23, which is a very short period of time, to then by by 20 multiplications of 64, you reach a period of time in excess of the required time for the age of the universe, a period of time on the order of 72 billion years. Well, if each time the uh, spiral goes into a state of collapse at the end of one of its cycles, then in the last 384 days of the existence of a universe like that, it would transit through half of its epochs of transition. Do you see what I mean? It's like a screaming Mimi. It really winds up. And uh, instead of the, the, the vision which physics gives us is that the really rapid transitions of phase and state occurred at the beginning of the universe. They whole professional lives are given over to discussing the first ten picoseconds of the physics of the universe, right? Well, I'm saying it's uh, I don't care about that. To, I think that the really interesting stuff will happen in a big hurry at the end of the universe. That the picture that the second law of thermodynamics gives us of just, you know, tumescence, maximum detumescence uh, is what it's picturing, is all wrong. And that actually this strange hyperdimensional force in the universe called life and information transfer is in the process of working itself up into a real tizzy and wrapping all space and time around itself. And uh, what was startling and what made me think that maybe I was losing my marbles was that when you look at time that way and push these novelty graphs against the historical continuum, I reached the conclusion that we entered the last 67-year period before the collapse of the state vector. At 8.30 in the morning on August the 6th, 1945, when the atomic bomb went off over Hiroshima, you see, it was a temporal reflection of the birth of the universe. It was actually a, you could call it an event, which was a reincarnation of the Big Bang, because each cycle begins with a bang. And that cycle, the fact that human beings had used atomic weapons on other human beings, meant that we had entered a new era a new epoch of moral danger and the stakes had been raised, you know, by a power of 64 to a new level. Now, using the mathematics inherent in the cycle, if you propagate forward from that date, 67 years, 104.25 days, you reach uh, uh, late November of 2012 A.D., and I concluded, based on all kinds of factors, personal and historical and so forth, that that was the fit, that, that if Hiroshima was, was day one, then the place where it all came together was this date in 2012. And I worked with that for several years before some kind soul, Henry Munn, I think, pointed out to me that the Mayan calendar 
which is a cycle of three of thir the long count calendar I'm now talking about is a cycle of 13 time periods which are called baktuns and the baktun is 396 years in duration after 13 baktuns the world ends completely and the 13th baktun of the classical mayan long count calendar is the winter solstice of AD 2012 within 30 days of the date that I had fastened in on using a completely different uh, path of analysis. And so this raised all kinds of questions, uh, one of which is, is it simply that individuals and civilizations who take mushrooms become, uh, I want to say, privy slash engulfed by a certain mathematical secret about the cosmic machinery. What is so important about this date in 2012? You know, the Mesoamerican cultures have the most uncanny history of uh, successful prophecy in the world. I mean, the Aztecs anticipated the coming of the Spanish the day the book of Chilambelum gives the day when the Spaniards would weigh anchor off the coast of Mexico. And of course, the fact that it happened exactly as prophesied was a major undoing of that civilization. So, I put this out. I, this was a very confusing experience for me to uh, channel or transmit this idea because I was interested in the I Ching. I had carried it with me in India. I used to throw it at each full moon, but I was not mathematically inclined. And when reading the philosophy of science, and people like Paul Feyerabend and Imre Lakatos, and, uh, and reading the history of science, and Thomas Kuhn, and all of those people trying to understand, you know, well, what is a true idea? What is true and what is false? And, and when you have an idea which makes claims as sweeping as these, then you want to try to understand just what the limits of knowability are. And I discovered that um, all you can require of any idea is that it be self-consistent, that it not generate any contradictions within its own set of rules, you see. And that's why astrology is uh, beyond criticism, because astrology is a mathematical theory with an interpretive exegesis attached to it. And who can quibble with the mathematical theory? Well, then the, ma the, the uh, uh, interpretational exegesis has to do with the sensitivity and subtlety of the interpreter. Well, isn't this true of mathematical data in science exactly the same way? So I discovered that what I had created was a self-consistent idea that appears to be sealed beyond refutation in some weird and uncanny way, which makes it seem very non-human because you can't really find your way into telling whether it can, can be answerable to the notion of objective truth. So what I've decided about it is that it's a, it's a teaching or it's a, it's a kind of, it's an exemplary model about how all process goes on. And it's a way of learning how things happen, to see f time as a modulated flux of elements, to see it as a series of waves moving at different speeds through which you are taking a vertical slice and then stacking that slice. And that gives rise to the multiplistic, ever-changing flux that is called the now. It is actually made up of reflections and adumbrations of the past. And it's made up of, of uh, anticipatory shock waves and intimations of the future. The past and the future are 
co-present in the now. They are, in fact, what's making it happen. You can almost think of it as a hologram where you have two, or, or a standing wave, where you have two wave systems, one from the past, one from the future, and where they cross an interference pattern forms, which has a curious uh, stability as a system in and of itself. And, and, and yet it's almost a ghost created by these other two realities. And that is the moving present. And uh, uh, mathematically, this notion of time that I evolved delivers, you know, the map of novelty, a two-variable flux, a wandering line graph that's uh, very pleasing for arguing with formalists. But what lurks behind it and what is so rich for the romantic and the shaman and the poet is these, this wandering line graph is the composite of, of the overlay of certain historical time periods which are in a state of flux at various speeds so that they give rise to an endless kaleidoscopic unfolding in what we call three-dimensional space and of what we call reality. And this is why I often mention Finnegan's Wake uh, in my lectures because Joyce understood this. He understood that every moment is caused by everything that happened in the past and everything that happened in the future. And I like to give you know, the, the trivial example that you find yourself in Hadrian's hamburger joint. This is because the Emperor Hadrian invaded England in a certain year and conducted a campaign. We are ghosts of past and future events. And what the, what the chaos at the end of history that we are now living through is, is that for thousands and thousands of years, people have felt a vague thing calling across time to humanness, calling us to be a certain way, to practice certain rituals, to observe the stars, to observe the plants, to observe birth and observe death, a calling, and that thing which some people have called God, whatever it is, is throwing a gigantic shadow over human history now, because now the creode of development that leads to our merging with this thing, the walls are very steep, the water is moving very swiftly, and it's almost as though the future event is throwing off great sparks that are themselves faceted, contradictory epitomizations of this mystery. This is what Mohammed and Christ and Buddha are. They are human personalities that were situated in time in such a way that they became macrocosmic, reflections of the superordinate edemic humanity that is going to be generated at the end of history and we are close we are close it is uh, it, all of history can be seen as the shock wave of this eschatological event this is what the prophets were anticipating the culmination of man's God-making effort in time will be the perfection and the release of the human soul. And it has, it, it's not that we are doing it, you see. It's that a natural law that we were previously unaware of is inexorably unfolding. And that is what all this cross-connectedness of, of uh, man into matter, plant into animal, uh, earth into space, all of this flowing and interconnectedness, this reaches right down into the rocks of the planet. This is not simply a phenomenon of biology. This is the unfolding of a general law of which biology is only the cutting edge of a wedge of becomingness which includes all being and reaches right down into the neutrinos. And it is... Uh, it, you know, 
to be a being in time is to share in the immense flood of precognitive anticipation that fills the universe in uh, anticipation of this event. And that's what being is, and that's why it's so rich and so complete within itself, and yet always somehow pointing beyond itself, because uh, the, uh, the richness of the matrix through which we are moving is uh, incomparable and beautiful. And, uh, and so I, this is the basis of my extreme optimism, is I think that everything is under control, that we are in the grip of a force so powerful that the notion that we could jeopardize or overthrow it is completely preposterous because uh, we are acting in accordance with a resonance that was set going millions and millions of years ago. And of course, being is fraught uh, with danger, but uh, the stakes are, uh, you know, to be at play in the fields of the Lord, to be at rest in the mansions of the goddess. And uh, it's, it's soon, I think, at least the historical mimicking of it is clearly soon, because uh, the, the thrust toward the millennium of this society will not be uh, uh, turned aside if it is not a law of the universe, then it will become a myth of human beings and be created anyway. So, since we are human beings, I see us as the central actors in that mandala. I mean, this is the task of the next hundred or five hundred years, to realize the alchemical nature of uh, humanity and being and have everything fused into a supernuminous concrescence that is time. Joyce said, all space in a nutshell. You know, all time bound into a lenticular vehicle, which is both, both everyone's and mine alone, and yours alone.